Okay, so before we start, yeah. I think yeah. that maybe we can first to understand when we say a uh, social evolution theory, what actually comes to our mind. So John, uh, so we kind of, you know, kind of do this conversation a bit differently mm -hmm. <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than the conventional we interview the theorist. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder from a, an audience or a host perspective, when you hear the word or the phrase social evolution theory, what comes up in your head? What comes up in my head is the first, the first, I actually, the first thing that comes up is a figure, Darwin, for some reason. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. That's fine. Darwin, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Darwinism. Uh, may, maybe it's because there is too much emphasis in my mind on evolution rather than social. Um, but then we could also, I, I don't know, think about Herbert Spencer. Wasn't it Herbert Spencer that uh, uh, applied uh, Darwin's thinking on, on, the, on, on the social structure? Uh, or he at least made use of the concept of evolution and applied it to the social structure. That is also something that comes to mind. Uh, but uh, other aspects that come to mind when I hear evolution is that Marxism, for instance, is an evolutionary uh, theory going from slavery to feudalism to capitalism to <laughs> socialism and eventually communism. That's some evolutionary trajectory there. And there is also an evolutionary trajectory, I would say, in, in liberalism and, and Fukuyama's famous thesis uh, of the end of history, right? Um, so with evolution, I am also incorporating elements that are teleological um, and, and linear, uh, in my understanding at least. That, that is what comes to my mind as well when I now uh, think about it a little more. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that's, that's what comes to my mind at least. Okay, so then you should that's definitely... actually a wonderful kind of a target for me to kind of a, a begin with our conversation on this particular. Yeah. So what is social evolution? How, you know, most of the social scientists think about evolution. So in my book, I had stated very clearly, uh, well, both Marx and Spencer, they actually had some evolution element, but the majority or the, the, the bulk of their thinking was not really evolutionist or evolution. They were really developmental. It means stage, teleological, unfolding, there was a design, you know, there's this linear thing. None of them actually is accepted by evolutionism. Evolution rejects, you know, stages, mm -hmm. uh, linear stuff, uh, teleological. So because evolutionism accommodates, uh, you know, accidents, contingency, uh, different uh, selection forces, and mm -hmm. also there's no predetermined you know, stage, you know, stage by stage. So if you read my book, mm. uh, you will uh, understand clearly those are the elements that are actually explicitly rejected by mm. uh, evolutionism. So Darwin was evolutionist. He was not really a Spencer kind of a uh, developmental kind of a stage thing. Although the term evolution was coined by Spencer, mm. that something we have to admit. Mm. Uh, finally, to go back to Fukuyama, the end of history thing is certainly anti-evolutionary because he was basically saying there was this final stage or something, mm -hmm. which, you know, the human society will stop or mm -hmm. uh, you know, stay with that. And mm. so human being as a species has been the most powerful niche constructor, you know, the, the Baltic world has ever known. And therefore we are constantly inventing, reconstructing, constructing, changing, transforming the human society. And therefore there is no possibility of the end of history. Mm. Even if you talk about, uh, you know, political system and economic system. Yeah, interesting, interesting. I mean, it's all. I think this is the interesting conversation because Alvin, uh, he has read the book. Uh, he has he's very immersed into your work. I have never read the book, so we come from totally different perspectives. We could even say that Alvin have uh, he has some kind of internal perspective, and I have an external perspective to to your work, and it's uh, very interesting. And and it also makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, when when um, 
uh, when we have uh, reached the end stage, the end of history, of course, evolution uh, ipso facto does not exist because we have reached the end stage. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that was at least what, what comes to my mind. Um, and, I, and I also think it's, uh, if we go to, Fuku just to uh, connect to Fukuyama, um, uh, e even though history will not end in the sense that human beings will still do things, events will occur, processes will unfold uh, when we have uh, reached the so-called end state. Um, but the thing is that I think Fukuyama is saying that the, the, um, the, um, the liberal principles uh, or the liberal regime can no longer be perfected. We have reached the end stage of man's uh, development in terms of, of the highest order principles, so to speak. And the, there is no better regime, there is no better system, there is no better principle than this. We cannot do anything better. But history will still uh, continue, but he referred to that part more of a caretaking of a museum, a very mm -hmm. boring type of history where we will be endlessly caretaking uh, or endless caretakers of the, the uh, liberal uh, museum. Uh, we will have no great wars to fight, no great struggles to die for. We will have uh, no big struggles for recognition or ideological campaigns that brought out these glorious uh, uh, struggles that brought uh, humanity forward towards this liberal end stage. So in some sense, there is, I think, some notion that history will still continue, but we can no longer perfect uh, the political principles. We cannot perfect the liberal principles more than, than has been done. Well, to, to use uh, the phrase, uh, and then I will let Alvin to, to speak too. Uh, to use the phrase, uh, you know, if we contract two particular terms, one is the survival of the fitter, and the other is the survival of the fittest. So uh, for Evolutionism, there is no possibility, or you know, that it didn't denies the, the so-called the survival of the fittest, which was coined by Spencer. So, in biological evolution and also in social evolution, there is only possibility for the survival of the fitter. Now, mm. come back to human society in our contemporary age. Certainly, I think it's a uh, it's a welcome uh, outcome that we don't have to, at least we hope so, we don't have to fight another great war, at mm. least uh, not something as uh, brutal as uh, in the destructive as in the World War One, World War Two, or even the kind of ideological confrontation between the Soviet Union and the West during the Cold War, there will still be competition for a fitter mm. kind of mm. a change. Mm. whether it's an uh, idea, institution, or even particular principles of, you know, liberalism, right? So uh, we are now witnessing different kind of way of, you know, managing, coping, uh, you know, different challenges within democracy, but also in different non-democracy. So they are uh, human beings, human society are constantly reinventing, inventing new ideas, phenotypes and organizations and institution to kind of a cope with the ever changing world. Right? So in, on that, I would stop and perhaps Alvin wants to jump in. Yeah, so just my observations on the conversations, right? Like when we talk about social evolution, it seems like different things come to different people's mind. That as like John, right, when you, uh, hear the word, um, I mean, the phrase social evolution theory, Spencer and Marx and so on and so forth, uh, Darwin comes to your head. But like, actually that's precisely what Shi Bin tried to reject. Mm -hmm. So now I have a question for Shi Bin. So it seems like, in fact, in your book, you spent almost a chapter or two actually to, to state what it is not social evolution theory. So it seems this la label has such a, you know, like a negative connotation. Why don't you rebrand it in a more positive light? Why did you choose uh, to use social evolution theory? Why not brand it differently? So people, if you will not evoke this kind of misconceptions in people's head. Well, great question, but there is really no other 
alternative term that I can convey with, you know, the, some of the core principles of, you know, evolutionism. Because once people really correctly admit or, you know, grasp the key or the central, um, the most critical uh, sign of evolution is, is really to deploy the central mechanism of evolution, that is, you know, variation selection and inheritance, or in social evolution, we, we can use uh, selection, variation, and retention or inheritance. So because evolution or evolutionism correctly understood really connects with the central mechanism of evolution, I struggled, but I eventually decided there's no better term to use evolution or evolutionism because that was the correct term should be really correctly understood rather than say, well, because there are so many misconceptions or misunderstanding about evolutionism, I have to use another term. That will be like my, you know, surrendering our evolution or evolutionism to a misunderstood or misconception, um, you know, within the wider social science or even among the regular folks. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, um, you mentioned now um, uh, four co uh, concepts. Would you say that um, those concepts are the core concepts? You mentioned selection, variation, retention, and inheritance. Uh, mm -hmm. Are those four concepts like the core concepts of, of the theory? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, well, let me correct one tiny part of your uh, discussion. So we use retention and inheritance somewhat in, uh, equivalently in, you know, evolutionary discussion because in human or even in biological evolution, in biological evolution, we use, you know, inheritance to mean mostly strictly genetic stuff. Mm -hmm. But in social evolution, it doesn't have to be genetics. We use retention more, I would say, appropriately. So selection, variation, and retention. These are the three components or key concepts, if you want to put that way, mm -hmm. within the central mechanism of evolution means as long as this evolution operates, the central mechanism of evolution, that is, variation, selection, retention, they operate. So that's what we call the universal evolutionism. Mm. So even if we find uh, a, a different biotech system on another you know, planet, which we don't know yet, or we find a social system that was not really created by human species, but by another highly intelligent uh, species, on some other uh, plane, we don't know. Oh, evolutionism still operates. And that means the central mechanism of, of evolutionism operates in that particular social system. Yeah, just to add one point, uh, uh, John, so basically this selection, uh, uh, very, sorry, variation, selections, and inheritance, they are connected by time. So just think this like a time dimensions there. So you can see that they're in sequence, like in social evolution, uh, it might change to like the, the, I mean, in natural selection, it's variation, selections and inheritance, right? But in social evolution, Shipping say that it could be selection first and then follows by variation uh, and then inheritance. Why uh, selections can uh, happen first because of the social power. So that so uh, Shipping uh, assumes that the social system differs from the biological system. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the sequence of the mechanism might vary. So so you yes. should see this. And they are connected through time. Yeah. Yes. And, and they are not three separate concepts. Why? Right. They are connected. You should see yeah, yeah. connected by time dimension. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>